this is the 11th leadership lesson. Um, if you have not been a part of one of these before, I would just tell you that the, these lessons are being recorded and they're put up on our website because people on the other side of the world are um, using them. And I've told them to use them freely. They can take these lessons and translate them into their own language and teach them. So I'm hoping that this will, this will be a blessing to people on the other side of the world with my whole heart. Um, so this morning we are in number 11 and it is October, not November. Thank you very much, Tracy. And here we go. I hope we go. There we go. Our overarching scripture that we've been using this entire time is 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. And it is about this simple theme. Let's read. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Here's what Paul's getting at. The next generation of leaders is already in our youth room and our children's Sunday school rooms. Or they are in the young adult room with Garrick and Sandy Hershey, or they are in the discipleship class that Steve Donovan is teaching. The next generation of Christian leaders for Cedar Grove is here. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, how will they become leaders? Who will bless them? Who will help them to discover their call? New leaders don't grow on trees as much as we would like them to. It's an, it's an intensive, and it has to be absolutely intentional from those who are in, on the church board, the deacons, the staff, we have to be intentional about seeing people that we see potential in and investing in those people. That goes for here, and that goes for the kingdom all around the world. Intentionality is everything. I've been doing this for a long time, and there were some people who came alongside me in 1978 and started investing in me. And in Reina, for that matter. Ken and Janet Beeson were among the first people who saw leadership potential in us and invested in us. In 1978, that is a long, long time ago. But they saw something in Reina and me that was a calling of God in seed form. And I'm deeply, deeply touched by that. I've had the honor of helping over 30 people into full-time Christian ministry over 45 years of pastoring. So what I'm sharing with you this morning, and in the previous 10 lessons, this isn't something I made up in the last few months. This is something I've been living since 1978 by proxy through Ken and Janet Beeson. And their deaths... I will take personally, because they mean a lot to me. They meant a lot to Rain and me then, they mean a lot to us now. This morning, we're going to look at a, a, a theme. Basically, what I'm talking about today is encountering God. This encounter Ezekiel has with God. What, what the Bible says is that God is looking for seekers. We can talk about, you know, God's going to do what God's going to do and all that. But God is looking for seekers. He wants, to, he wants to have people who will seek His heart more than they want their own ideas. And this is going to flesh out as we go along. Every person who turns to the Lord, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ the Lord, we all come at our personal walk with Jesus if, with one single common passion. God found us 
And we turn to Him because God found us by His Spirit. We turn to Him and we're going to spend the rest of our lives passionately wanting to know Him and His presence in our lives. Now, I can't overstate that. But that's a common passion. We, everyone in this room, if you know Jesus, you have a desire like I do to know Him. To know His Word, His ways, His heart. So, the desire to know Him, it, 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 it's what binds us together as believers here and on the other side of the world. I, I, can't, I can't tell you what it's like. I wish I could. If you saw the videos from 2019 and 2018 when I was in Pakistan and saw the crowds of people and the, and the worshipful dancing and praising God for an hour and then the message started after an hour of hop and bop aerobic praise in Pakistan. I mean, if you saw that, the, the passion in those people. We're, we're talking, we're talking 6,000 people in front of me sitting on mats with their legs folded with their notebooks writing as fast as they could write for 45 minutes. Most of us in this room, if there weren't chairs in here, we'd go home. Right? We're talking passion to know what God says. Now think about where Pakistan is and think about the government of Pakistan. Folks, this issue of, of hearing the voice of the Lord, your, your brothers and sisters on the other side of the world who know Jesus, they are just as passionate about this as any person I have ever met in my life. We're going to read some scriptures together. Here we go. When he, the shepherd, has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep followed him because they know his voice. I have other sheep that are not of this pen, I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Jesus said to his disciples, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. Now, the emphasis, by the way, there, the underlining are all mine, because I was trying to make the point and, and accentuate the point in our thinking. It's about the voice of Jesus, and the voice of Jesus will be heard as the Holy Spirit and you read this together, especially the red letters. The voice of Jesus is heard through the Word of God. The voice of Jesus will never contradict the Word of God. Ever. Anyone who says something Jesus told them to do that is contrary to the Word of God, made it up. Or there's another Jesus that you and I don't know about speaking to him. Are you good? So here's what I, what I want to try to help us to flesh out today. I don't know about you, but when I first came to Jesus, I thought it was all my idea. I can't speak for you, <laughs> but I can speak for me. I thought, boy, I, I, I found something good here. And when I started to seek the Lord, I realized the Lord had been seeking me for years. And I just wasn't listening. Till I was at the bottom of the barrel. Emotionally. Spiritually. That's why I'm listening. The Lord was seeking. There's an amazing scripture. And I think it's easy for us to just. Wade right through it. And not think about what the Lord Jesus Christ said to the Samaritan woman. He said. Those who worship him. Must worship in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking people who will worship in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking people who will worship in spirit and truth. I think it's easy to blow through that clause. 
no relation to Santa and Mrs. Claus. I think it's easy to blow through that and miss. The Father was looking for you long before you were looking for the Father. When you turn to the Lord, you find a God who's been pursuing you. Hallelujah. Well, that's worth showing up for, to be straight up with you. That's worth showing up for. So, two scriptures. Let's read these together, please. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. So the Lord comes and finds a simple, ordinary man in a limestone quarry. Week after week, month after month, he draws, he loves, he convicts, he impresses, he whispers. I think about this a lot. I'm, I, I make no bones about this. My spiritual hero, apart from the people who are living and who lived and invested in my life, like my Uncle Sam and Pastor Heidler and Owen Oliver and Luke Kiefer and people like that, I make no bones about this. The, the thing that I most love to read is John Wesley. And those who are making points originally made by John Wesley. John Wesley called this paragraph up here prevenient grace. It's the grace we get so we can get to grace. The grace we get until we can get to grace. The Lord found me in the bottom of a drug barrel, alcohol barrel, nicotine and foul mouth barrel, and I got grace to get to grace. Hallelujah. The prophet Joel taught in a time that was just horrific. Because the people of Israel had turned away from God completely. And I want you to remember, when God set the children of Israel up in the promised land, do you remember what he said he wanted to be to them? He said he wanted to be their God and he wanted them to be his people. But do you remember what he said? He said, I want you to live under my blessing so the nations around you will want to know me too because your lives are so blessed. He wanted to dwell in the midst of them and draw all nations to himself. How'd they do? Rather than turning to him, the children of Israel turned to flesh. Man, woman, disgusting idolatry, man-made religion, and ignored the holiness and majesty of God. Joel is writing at a time when he's saying, if you folks will just honestly wake up, rend your heart. Does this at all sound familiar to you for your culture today? Church, wake up, rend your heart, return to Jesus, repent with all your heart. You are living on human provisions, and your life is a train wreck. That's what Joel is writing in the Revised Tetner Edition. So, there's a deep heart cry from the Father God in Joel 2.17. Joel is using, the, the temple is still standing at this point. It has not yet been burned by fire when Joel writes this. And so, um, you, you need to... You need to get the picture of what Joel is saying in Joel 2.17. Let's read. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. Now we're going to flesh that out a little bit as we open up this lesson on encountering God. Where did the priests do their thing? You remember? The altar and then in the holy place, right? Where's the temple porch? It's outside of those things. The portico. Solomon's portico. Remember the believers met in Solomon's portico? Had chicken tacos and 
Here's the, here's the picture, and I'm so glad to have two aspiring preachers back there looking at me, smiling right now. This will preach in the Spanish church, Ramon and Evelyn. Look at this. The temple, the, sorry, I want to back up. How do I back up? I can't back up. So, the, 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 the priests who minister before the Lord, that represents the church. The priests who minister before the Lord represents the church. That's the people of God. And we're the people who are supposed to be in the presence of God. The temple porch represents the place of congregating. In the temple porch, people are talking about all kinds of wonderful things. What they had for dinner last night, how they, how they love their friends... They're saved, they're baptized, they're going to heaven, and they're talking about just about everything. But at the altar, something else happens. Amen? At the altar, something else happens. At the altar, you're not talking about what you had for dinner this week. The Phillies. Or how wonderful Penn State played Ohio State. <laughs> At the altar, you're not talking about those things. What are you doing at the altar? You're dying. The altar is a place of death. It was a place of death for the cows and the bulls and the lambs and the sheep and the goats. And it's a place of death today for the child of God who would be redeemed and who would snuggle up close to God and listen to his voice. The altar represents the place of self-interest dying. The things in me that prevent me from seeking God with my whole heart and seeing the footprints of the Holy Spirit in my life. At the temple porch, conversations are mostly about the human. The believers are there, they walk with the Lord, but it's mostly about the human. Uh oh, I don't know what's going on here. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. This opened up in a way that I'm. There we go. This opened up in a way I'm not familiar with this morning. Sorry about that. So, at the temple porch, the conversations are about the human. At the altar, the conversation is with God. At the temple porch, it's a place of fellowship. We play card games and eat snack foods. No card games and snack foods at the altar. You see in the euphemism, the, the word picture? Got to get beyond the human to encounter God. Press into the altar to be set on fire with his love. Our scripture today is Ezekiel 1, 25 through 317. And relax, we're not going to read it all and do it all. We don't have that kind of time. But I'm going to show you snippets of how this is going to look over time. So the first thing I want you to see is the necessity of a fresh vision of God. Now, when Ezekiel writes... Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is burned with fire, and all of the people are deported to somewhere else, and the people who are back in Israel are the poorest, and the people who've been brought in from other lands. Israel is decimated. And God says to Ezekiel, my people have been living on their human provisions long enough, look where it got them. Ezekiel, come be with me. Revised Hebrew edition. Ezekiel, come be with me. In your devastation, Ezekiel, come be with me. The necessity of a fresh vision of God, a new visitation of the Holy Spirit, is that God shows himself for who he really is. If you read Ezekiel 1, 2, and 3, and I mean really read it carefully, that's your homework 
when you get home today or tomorrow, that's your homework. But if you read it carefully, you will see a man that is called to do something that a human being cannot do unless God is in it with him. It is a powerful, powerful call. One of the things God says to Ezekiel is, they are going to fight against you. They're going to hurt you. They're going to come after you. But I've made your forehead like flint. They will fight against you, but they will not win because I've sent you with my word. I've sent you. I don't know about you, but if God called you to do something, and then he said, oh, by the way, they're not going to listen to you. They're going to hate you. They're going to attack you, but you'll be all right. You ready to just sign right up for that one? <laughs> That's, that was Ezekiel's call. I've made your forehead like flint. They'll fight against you, but they will not win. <laughs> Boy, that just makes you feel all fuzzy all over, doesn't it? To contemporize this, I am convinced the Holy Spirit of God must, must, must do a visitation with His church in North America. He must. We must experience Him. We must encounter Him. The church in North America has lost its voice because half of the voice of the church in North America is preaching secularism instead of the Word of God. I'm not talking about the BIC church. Or thank God our BIC church is sticking to Scripture, and I'm so grateful. We have an absolutely wonderful bishop in Heather Beatty. Absolutely wonderful. But half the church in North America is saying sin is fine as long as it's done in love. The church needs a visit. The church needs a visit. We need to get our voice back. Okay. First scripture. GL. Ezekiel 1, 25 to 28. Gary Lawler. Then there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the expanse over their heads was what looked like a throne of sapphire, and high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that, that from what appeared to be his waist up, up, he looked like glowing metal as if full of fire, and that from there down, he looked like fire, and brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. So, uh, what do you think happened to Ezekiel when he saw the Lord? <laughs> oh my goodness you remember what we studied in uh, Revelation 1 we looked at the vision that John had with Jesus and he fell down and he was just overwhelmed so here's what I want you to see when we've been with God visiting him and he's been with us the Holy Spirit does his work of holy love in us. And when he does, the things of this world, the values of this world, the, the world's crazy preoccupation with sex and money pales in significance when we visited with God. What matters is preparing for forever. And what matters about preparing for forever is how many we can take along with us. I can't take my 71 Chevy to heaven with me. But I can take people I love here on the other side of the world that I can help introduce to Jesus Christ before I die. I can't take them along. Amen? Amen? That's what matters. When we've been with God, that's what matters. Ezekiel's inadequacy of his humanity 
somebody already said it, he was just completely undone, just absolutely overwhelmed. When you are in the presence of God, it is really, really hard to stay standing. Knees and faces are the, often the biblical picture. We are powerfully struck with how inadequate we are. I face this every time I come to preach the Word of God. Every time I come to preach the Word of God, I face the inadequacy of what God has asked me to do. People say to me, well, why are you still nervous after all these years, PK? You shouldn't be nervous. I mean, you've been doing this for 45 years. Okay, you stand before God with a word from Him for 200 people and tell me you wouldn't be nervous that you might mess something up. Amen? Amen. When Isaiah saw the Lord, remember what happened to him? Woe is me, I cried. I'm undone. It's right up there on the screen behind me. Next scripture. Um, Wendy Woman. Then one who looked like a man touched my lips, and I opened my mouth and began to speak. I said to the one standing before me, I am overcome with anguish because of the vision, my Lord, and I feel very weak. How can I, your servant, talk with you, my Lord? My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. Again, the one who looked like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed, he said. Peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Speak, my Lord, since you have given me strength. <laughs> God's provision, God's power for the, for the task is what he really needed. When we've met with the Lord, the pronouns switch. When we've visited God, the pronouns switch from me, Lord, I, Lord, to you, Lord, what do you want? There's a profound sense that God gives commissions to speak. It began for me in 1978. It's happening right now in Garrick and Amber, here in your own church. And our sister, C.F., whom you will hear on November 5th, that commission to speak is being given to them. Divine commissions for Ramon and Evelyn. Divine commissions to speak require divine provisions of power. If you're going to witness for Jesus, witness to what you've experienced. Witness by his word, but witness to what you've experienced in his presence. It is really hard for somebody to argue with. I was reading the scriptures this morning and the Lord spoke to me. And he said, I was supposed to tell you, he loves you. And here's this scripture the Lord asked me to give you. Pretty hard to argue with that. Just saying. What I can do, how I can make things better, what I can do for people, pales in significance. In Acts 2, Jesus is speaking to his closest followers, and he writes, and he says these words, written by Luke for us. Let's read. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. To contemporize that, you will be my witnesses to your family, your town, your county, your state, your nation. And with our friend CF, somewhere else. Start here. Move there. That's what that says, right? Start here, move there. So, the power of the Holy Spirit. 
This is one of my favorite things about having had divine encounters. Uh, i got to tell you a story. I think I have time to do it. i got to tell you a story. Um, the first time I ever experienced the power of God, it, it didn't happen to me, it happened through me. We were having a meeting at the Mechanicsburg Church. It was about 1996 or 7. Um, it was, the place was packed. Uh, I mean, absolutely packed. It was a Sunday night. The place was packed. And the Spirit of God had been falling on our services for about three or four months. And we were having this special praise and prayer night with the churches from Harrisburg. So it was a multi-ethnic, multi-racial service. And it's just packed. The Life Center was completely stuffed with people. Standing room only, all around the outside. And the Lord began to do an amazing work at the end. One of my friends there, uh, African-American friend Raleigh Wingfield, brought the word, and God began to minister. Well, it was a... I was a guy who had graduated from Messiah College and knew all the answers. And now I was seeing things that I had no framework for. Are you tracking so far? I'm seeing people shake and get weak and hit their knees. And one guy one Sunday morning crawled to the altar weeping. Doctor of psychology crawled to the altar weeping one Sunday morning. I'm a good country boy from Juniata County, and I graduated from Messiah College, and we didn't study that. <laughs> so, Dr. Henry Ginder and Dr. C.B. Byers were there that night. That won't mean much to some of you, but for some of you, you're saying, yeah, that means something to me. And I went back to them and I said, Brothers, I feel like I'm to ask you to put your hands on me as we pray over people and lay hands on them together, the three of us. And they were at this point retired, and they were not allowed to do anything official anymore. But they said, oh, Henry says, oh, Brother Hefner, we'd be delighted. If you know Henry, that's exactly how he sounded. So they came, and the three of us started praying. And this precious lady from Harrisburg, I mean, she is a magnificent woman of God. Husband deserted her and her three children when they were quite young. She lived as a prayer warrior and as a, as a biblical widow like Anna in the temple and prayer warrior for Raleigh and Renee Wingfield. And she came up to Bishop Henry and Bishop C.B. and to me and she said, Pastor Ken. I feel like you three men are supposed to pray for me. So I thought, okay. And I'm thinking, don't you want Raleigh and Renee to pray for you? I mean, they're your pastoral coach. I feel like I'm supposed to. So I lay my hands on her, and like a good brethren in Christ boy, I shut my eyes and I have my hands on her. And Henry and Charlie each have a hand on my hand. And I start praying for her, and all of a sudden her head disappeared. And there's a crack between my feet. She was face down on the carpet. Her arms and legs spread straight out. She never caught herself. She just hit, hit the carpet and just lay there. And I thought, did she break her nose? Did she break her glasses? What was that crack I heard? And I saw she was breathing fine, and there was no blood anywhere, and I stood up, and I looked at Henry, and he says, Oh, Brother Hepner, this happens. <laughs> Didn't teach that in any classes at Messiah College, did they? You see what I'm trying to show you? The power isn't you. Power is the Spirit. Gary's going to talk to you about the power of the Gospel. The power of the Gospel is God is in His words working. Did you feel anything? Oh yeah, I've had electrical because electrical volts went through my hand like I stuck my finger in a light socket. Yeah, it's frankly it scared me. I, I didn't know what to think. 
And then Henry, Henry looks at me and pats me on the shoulder. Oh, Brother Hefner, this happens. <laughs> My point is, the Spirit of God is everything. And, and when, when He hits us, when the Spirit of God hits us, I mean with a sweet sense of His presence, you just don't want to get up right away. We'll hang around in that for a bit. Are you good? Everybody good? Some of you are thinking, we got us a radical on our hands up here this morning. So, Ezekiel 2, 1 and 2. Let's read. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. That is everything. That is everything. As it relates to you and me carrying the Word of God into the world. That is everything. A couple thoughts here. Ezekiel knew the Lord was there. Nobody had to tell him it was the Lord. Ezekiel knew the Lord was there and that he had poured his Holy Spirit out in him. Ezekiel experienced the power of God empowering him. And his words became this incredible provision that God would use him to, to, to make known. Spiritual commissions must have the living word of God. Let's read. But the house of Israel is not willing to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me for the whole house of Israel is hardened and obstinate. Let's all sign up for that. But I want to say something now here. You already have. Your culture has turned its back on Jesus. Your culture is obstinate. It's not willing to listen to you. Love them anyway. Tell them anyway. Go into all the world and preach the good news. Amen? Starting in Juniata County. Listen to what he says. Let's continue reading here. But I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified for, uh, through, by them, for they are a rebellious house. All God asked for was Ezekiel's surrender. God would be his strength. God would be the word. God would be the power. He just wanted a surrendered Ezekiel, and he just wants a surrendered you and me. That's all God's after. He's got this. He's got you. He wants surrendered people. The inner assurance of his word. And this is uh, Linda Hostler. L.H. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I looked, behold, a hand was stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of a book was on, in it. And he spread it before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back. And there were word, written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. Well. And he said to me, hold on. <laughs> son, son of man. Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go. Speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me this scroll to eat. And he said to me, Son of man, feed the, your belly with this scroll that I give you, and fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. The word of God became Ezekiel's provision of grace. God's truth, God's word alive, became Ezekiel's provision of grace. Life must have food. You're gonna, you ate something yesterday, but you're going to need to eat something today. I promise you are. You can live off the fat of the land only for so long. 
just a joke. <laughs> Here's what I'm hoping every person will take away from this lesson today. The Holy Spirit wants to make the word personal to you. He does. He has things for you to do that I can't do. Just like he has things for me to do that you can't do. There are people in your life I can't touch, but you can. And he wants the word of God to be personal to you. Under the anointing of God, that can and will happen. The truth is, we must be the first partakers. We must be the first partakers of everything God wants to say. Ezekiel 3, 10 and 11, we learn that we're called to hear God first, then speak. So, I want to give you an illustration, and for the two Christmas Sundays, the, the message will be more brief, but we're going to look at Mary and how God used that sweet 14-year-old girl in the life of Jesus. I just want to give you a seed thought here. Mary didn't give birth to what Mary thought she should give birth to. Mary gave birth to what God put in her. That <coughs> sent you to your friends with holy love, if you can grab that. Mary birthed what God spoke into her. Mary birthed it. His name is Jesus. She was impregnated with the Word of God. She had something she had to share, something she had to speak. The living Word of the living God. Are you good? The Holy Spirit has many things He wants to do here in Juniata County. Many things. I can only help you with some of them. The rest of them you have to do. My brothers and sisters on the other side of the world, there are many people for your church families to reach. You can't do that alone as leaders. Your whole church family has to reach them. You have to do it together. Ezekiel 2, 10 and 11. Let's read. And he said to me, Son of man, listen carefully and take to heart all the words I speak to you. Go now to your countrymen in exile and speak to them. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, whether they listen or fail to listen. The people you take the love of Jesus to in your family and in your workplace, it doesn't matter whether they hear you or not as you, as you think about it. I don't think they heard me. What matters is you spoke it. Now the Holy Spirit has something that he can press into a woman. You with me? When he, when he pressed past the throngs at the temple porch, thousands of people got to the temple porch. Not many got to the altar, and it's still true today. Lots and lots and lots of people love the fellowship. More and more and more of us need to love the worship. Got to get in the right boat. The altar with Jesus. Son of man, I put it in you. Now go speak it. There's a powerful sense that I hope all of you will take away today. And it's this. The presence of God, as, as, the, as the presence of the living God moves on us from heaven. His presence poured into us. His presence received. The Holy Spirit brings His provisions. It's, it's poured deeply into your heart and mind. And the reason He does that when we meet with Him at the altar is not just for us. It's for when we turn around from the altar and go back out and interact with people who are on the porch. Are you tracking with the analogy? I hope you are. What God gives us isn't just for us. It's for the people we love 
who are on the porch, content in human provisions. God wants to pour in his provisions. I'm going to wrap it up here. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. When we have truly visited with God, when we press beyond the altar, there's only one, one way to come away from that experience. God says, let the kingdom priest press in to meet with me at the altar. Come and receive. Surrender to me. Die to self-interest. Let me love you. Let me pour my love into you. I was praying a couple weeks ago. And again, this is not covered in your notes, but I was praying a couple of weeks ago, and I felt that I got this whisper from the Spirit of God, this impression from the Spirit of God. And the, the question came to me, Lord, why aren't more people bearing your presence with, with deep, deep love for the people that they come in contact. Why aren't more of your people being filled with your presence and filled with desire to help other people come to know Christ? And he said, I got this whisper back because they're so full of life and so full of what they want that they're not coming to the altar to empty themselves that I might fill them. So full of life, so busy. If one more person says to me, I'm so busy, I think I'm going to lay hands on them suddenly in the mighty name of Jesus. <laughs> because that tells me, I'm too busy to have time with God, tells me, your will is more important than you finding Jesus' will for your life. Y'all good? Here's what I believe God wants us to see. The satisfaction we have as we come to lead people to Jesus Christ in our spheres of influence, watching Jesus Christ prove himself in that life. What do you think it was like for Ken and Janet Beeson when they saw God begin to use Raina and me? What do you think that was like for them? If God can use that guy, <laughs> right? If God can use that guy. Look, I, I, I finished a couple minutes early this morning. If you have comments you'd like to make, Dan has the mic back there. Comments, questions, I, I will make something up if I don't know the answer. I'll just pull something out of the air. Phil Varner. We just read something this week about... A man went to Billy Graham and, and uh, said, must I go to church every Sunday? He said, uh, even if an uh, ox falls in the ditch, you can take it out on Sunday, on the Sabbath day. And Billy said, well, if the ox falls in the ditch too many Sundays, he said, it's either time to get rid of the ox or close the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> Need the microphone before we go? <laughs> so, there will be a letter read in a few minutes about um, the end of the con uh, the end of the pastoral review process. So, if you want to hear that letter read, stick around. And we're also going to dedicate babies to the Lord. And then I'm going up and share a message with my Spanish brothers and sisters while Garrick preaches number two. May God bless you as you seek the Lord and may you have visits with Jesus that propel you into action. For my brothers and sisters on the other side of the world, this lesson is yours now. You can use it any way you want to. I love you. I want to empower you as you lead people in your culture. God bless you. Thanks, everyone.